people who probably aren't familiar with the Cohasset Historical Society. And uh, we'll, after the movies, uh, after the filming, we'll, I'm happy to give you tours or answer any questions about the society. But one of the things that we have is a lecture series. And uh, our fall lecture series, um, tonight we have Jim Campbell. And we also are grateful to the 143 TV, local TV channel. Um, and Richard is, a, is our videographer. You get lots of credit for this, right? Yeah. And, he, and he gets to edit it, too. Um, so thank you. And it will be on the local, local station. Um, as I said, tonight's speaker, and you must have read it in the paper, we've gotten all kinds of publicity about the filming of the movie. Uh, Jim is a, is a society board member, and his resume is filled with very impressive maritime experience. Tonight he's going to discuss the 1952 U.S. Coast Guard rescue mission um, off the coast of Chatham. And the, that incident was what precipitated the book, The Finest Hours, by Michael Tukas and um, Casey Sherman. And now the Disney film of the same name that will be released in 2016. So it's as you if you're from around here, it's been an exciting few weeks with the filming of the movie. And um, it was here at the Pratt Building, as well as other locations in in Cohasset. This building was trans formed into uh, the Cape Cod Bell Telephone Company um, in 1952. And um, Jim is going to re relate the incident and give um, the information about that. And then later on, if anyone has questions about stardom and filmdom and Tinseltown, we'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> My pleasure. Jim, it's your turn. All right, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody on that side get on that side. <laughs> so, um, as you know, the, they're filming a movie, and just to preface this a little bit with what's going on, because it is interesting, and I had the <coughs> had the. Uh, uh, Movie stars, I guess that's what you call them, if you don't know who they are. Uh, Chris Pine, Casey Affleck, and Holiday Granger are starring in this. This is the motion picture. So, the Finest Hours, written by Michael Togas and Casey Sherman. Uh, is about two tankers, two, what a T2 tank, considered T2 tankers, a uh, class as T2 tankers, and one of, the, one of the members brought in a picture of a T2, for those that may not know what a T2 looks like, we tried to get a model, but uh, you've probably all seen them at some time or another. They're all out of service now, and uh, this is the type of ship that we're talking about in the storm. There were two of them, they're 500 feet. <coughs> and um, it's, it's interesting, they both, there are, no, there, were, there are no coincidences, is that true? I guess we hear it said, but there's a similarity. They were both, uh, they're not sister ships, but they were both similar. They were both in uh, Louisiana, on the, on the Mississippi River, at different refineries at the same time one at Norco and one at uh, Humble Oil in Baton Rouge. And they left, you know, approximately the same time and arrived up here in Boston and Massachusetts Bay about the same time. One going to Poland, one going to Boston. All, I don't want to say it, it's not a coincidence, but it all, it all happened. Well, that's the train, that's the business, and that was the night of February 18th. So as they came up the coast and arrived in Boston, the uh, Pendleton, first one here, first one closest in, 
couldn't make its way into Boston Harbor because uh, it was so, uh, weather was so strong, so uh, visibility was so poor, they couldn't see the lighthouse. They couldn't see the light at Boston Light or any of the lights. So the captain decided he'd hold the and he went out into the bay and he, and he uh, tried to keep way on the ship and let the storm work its way out. Um, well, that's, that's, you know, as best he could, it was a hurricane at least, and he drifted down the coast, and he got down off of Cape Cod, and uh, the ship cracked. The, the seas are 60, 70 foot seas, the tanker was a T2, um, full of this oil, cold water, questionable construction, uh, welded uh, fabrication and uh, it, it, the ship cracked. And the bow floated away with the captain and his five officers, four officers, and the stern held the rest of the men. And that was one incident. The other one was the Mercer. Same, similar situation. Came up the coast, loaded with oil, going to uh, Portland, Maine, and had a similar similar situation in as much as they tried to uh, hope to in the weather, let, it, let the storm abate and so they could make their way to Poland and it cracked in half, in the middle, almost the same place, but too close to be a uh, coincidence. But anyways, um, and then you can see where the, a little map here, somewhere. Over here, Jim. Yeah, two of them. One for one half, one for the other. Where the two vessels are coming down, it's Cape Cod, the Pendleton, and the Mercer. So they find out that the Mercer's in trouble because they are able to send out a radio signal. So they dispatch cutters and some light boats to the Mercer, and uh, the rescue begins on the, on the Mercer. And in the meantime, for 14 hours, the Pendleton's floating down the coast along uh, perpendicular, parallel to, parallel to Cape Cod. Um, now, nobody knew where the, what, where the, what was going on with the Pendleton. And the first report of the Pendleton came from a woman in Nosset Inlet who saw it go by her house. And she looked up and saw the, the Hulk, what it was, and called the police. And that started a series of events, and the Coast Guard now had to uh, engage their 36 foot uh, Chatham lifeboat. And then now enters the, the personality of, of the uh, chief boatswain mate at that station, Bernie Weber. Bernie Weber was uh, the warrant officer, <coughs> told Bernie, Bernie, get yourself a crew together and get out there and help them. You hear? And he's from Tennessee. So they make a point of that, I got a kick out of that. He heard him all right. He wondered why he picked him. There were other <coughs> same grade officers there in the station. But he went, he went. Bernie, Bernie was the son of a uh, minister. He's a boatswain mate first class. He's the son of a minister in Milton, who was the pastor at the temple, uh, I think it's Baptist Church. In Tremont Street. And Bernie, Mr. Weber thought Bernie would be a good candidate to follow in his father's footsteps, but he never asked Bernie. And so Bernie went, you know, got to be a little bit of a, a maverick. He had four brothers and they were all servicemen and went in the Coast Guard. And he wanted Bernie to go to Mount Hermon. <coughs> he sent him out to Mount Hermon School and he ran away from Mount Hermon. Finally, his father agreed, okay, we'll let the Coast Guard be your, your life. So he went through Coast Guard training, went to maritime service, and he got stationed at, at the Chatham Light, Lighthouse, Chatham Station, Chatham Mass. And I had a lot of experience, but he was only 24 years old. And the warrant officer at the station did now delegates him to take the 36-foot lifeboat out to this Hulk, and they don't know where it is. They don't have that kind of equipment at the time. They had radio direction finders, or radar wasn't working. So they were looking for him as best they could. They, they got in the, he got his crew together, 
He got in the lifeboat and he started out. Dark and without it, without any light, without being able to see anything, he headed out to Chatham Bar. Any of you that are familiar with the Chatham Bar, you know it's it's kind of tricky and it's, and it's kind of tricky in, in the best weather. It was tough this night. And they're uh, they're uh, making their way, and, and Bernie and these guys are trying to get the courage together to keep going. These are 60 foot seas that are crashing over this lifeboat. 60 foot seas. There's four men in it at this time, and they headed out to the bay, and uh, they have a rough idea of where the ship is. So as they head out, because of Bernie, now he wasn't an over-religious fellow, but they started singing Rock of Ages. Can you imagine this now? Four men in a lifeboat, in a full hurricane, 60 foot sea singing Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. And it goes on, there's three more stanzas, and they sang the whole thing. And as they got out, they cleared the bar, the Chatham bar, 60 foot wave hit the boat. They thought they were gonna shatter the boat, it wouldn't help. They made their way out and came up, found by luck, by just chance, they found the Pendleton, the hull of the Pendleton. They didn't know what it was, it was a hull. And uh, it was broken in half, and they were able to get up to it. And um, as they approach it, now remembering that there's 60 foot seas and 70 mile an hour winds, they get up to the Pendleton, they get up to the sheer part of the ship where it's broken in half, and uh, they see nothing. Um, it's dark, so the, the waves, the crashing, they see nothing. He felt like, oh, well, we had come out here for nothing. There's nobody here. They thought they were lost. And then a, then a fellow showed up. Now they're up, they're in the water. They're up, this fellow that came out of the, uh, on deck, on the tank, I was, um, 70 feet, 60, 70 feet higher, one guy. And he came out and uh, they saw him, everybody saw each other and they were delighted and he disappeared and he went back inside. Well, then he came back out with 32 sailors. And they all had life jackets on. And uh, they were looking at him because at this point, Weber thought, I think I'll get on the ship with my crew and take my chances on that ship than rather be out here in this lifeboat because we're getting battered around. And the next thing that happens is a Jacob's ladder comes down from the top of the, from the hulk from the ship and the sailors start coming down. They get the lifeboat underneath the ladder and they just jump and land on the deck, up the foredeck right here, holding on, you know, banging down getting held grabbed by the, the sailors that are there and putting them in the forward hatch, forward hold here, <coughs> one after another. And uh, he ends up with uh, 32, 32 men in, in a space that's to hold eight. And he lost one man, one fellow that was a, was the one loss that he had was a, was a it's kind of sad, was he, uh, I want to get it right, was he, uh, was a cook, a wiper, 300 pound guy who, as he made his way down the ladder at 300 pounds, and also had no shirt on, had given his shirts to his clothing to others that were freezing, he slipped off the ladder. Uh, makes for a good Hollywood movie. And he's in the water, and they're trying to pull him out, and you can see the side. You know, it isn't that too, it isn't that difficult, it doesn't look that to be too hard to get him out, but then four of them were trying to get him, but he was a 300 pound guy. And they lost him, and a couple of times they got him back. And finally, unfortunately, he, the, his name was Tiny, surprisingly <laughs> enough. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and they were very popular with the crew. He ends up between the lifeboat and the ship, and uh, stayed with uh, Weber the rest of his life, he says. That so disappointing. Um, but they got him on the boat, got everybody on, and then uh, Bernie re re 
recalls words from his father. You receive this quote, you receive the strength and the courage, and you know your duty. And that carried him through uh, this, this portion of the rescue. Now, all the time, they were never happy with it. I mean, not happy, but they were never confident. There was always great concern that they, they would go over, they would get lost, they'd lose all hands, and uh, it, it would end tragically. But it, it, it's a great boat. Those that know it, those that know of it, it's a great boat. self writing boat, self bailing boat, self-everything boat. Couldn't, couldn't have been better. Very slow. That's all. It was, it was, but other than that, it was, it was the right boat at the time. So now he's got his boatload of people. 60, no, 30, 30 and a four crew, 36 people. 36 people on his lifeboat. And he's out five, six miles off of, the, of uh, Cape Cod. Um, approximately, he's having enough five miles. It's only five miles, right? It's only five miles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Conditions were a little bit more. But, so he has to get back. He has no, no um, navigation equipment. There are no <coughs> signals. There are no lights. Uh, nothing. It's, it, it's, all he can do is turn his back to the sea. I mean, the only directional that he had was the waves, the ocean that was pounding on him. For, and of course, coming from the east, northeast, <coughs> get his direction from that, put it behind him, and head to shore. The plan was, we're going to go to the beach, we're going to run the boat up on the beach, and he gives directions to all of the crew, all of you, as soon as you hear the boat hit the, hit the bottom, as we run up on the beach, all of you get out. Help those that are hurt, but get out right away, get out of the boat, figuring they're going to run up on the beach, and the next wave is going to come up and push them, and the next wave is going to come up and pull them back into the water and back and forth. You all know the routine of the wave action like that on a small boat on a beach, only times 10. So that was concerning, but that's what they had decided to do. The coach guy, mm -hmm. commander wanted him to turn the boat and head it back to sea to join a cutter that was in the area that would have taken them aboard. He decided against that, and, and uh, you know, there's something to be said about that. And getting people out of the water, transferring people from a boat to a vessel, a larger vessel, uh, in, a, in, in these conditions, 70-foot seas, uh, 60, 70-foot seas, 70-mile-an-hour wind, uh, seas blowing, uh, visibility poor, it just it doesn't work today. They still, have, they still can't do it today. Effectively, without, without great danger. So anyways, Bernie says, no, we're going to the beach. He, he shut off his phone. They wanted the court martial him later for that. He turned his phone off. He didn't want to hear the commander from the, from the uh, cutter that was, that was uh, telling him to head out. He saw that as to be too risky. So now he's, he's trying to get to the beach. He's, he doesn't know, they don't know where they are. They, they, know, they know about where they are. They're local people. It's Chatham. They're, they grew up there. It's like Cohasset Harbor and you're going up to Minot. Or you're going up the beach. You know, you go up the hull or you go down or you go to Provincetown. You have a sense of direction that stays that's kind of built into you like a homing pigeon. You can figure out where you go. So if you can see, like, if you can see that map, this one here probably can chart probably a little easier. Um, here they are, this is the Pendleton here. Here they are coming out. This is the fish pier in Chatham. Here, this is where they come down and out, and they get knocked around and so forth and get the sailors on, the, on their uh, rescue boat. And uh, they gotta find their way back, only they can't see anything. And they're motoring along thinking they're going to go to the beach. Well, there's a, now a red light flashing. Now they see a red light flashing. They're looking up through the binoculars. They can't figure out where it's coming from. Is it a radio beacon up there at the RCA, the RCA plant, or the RCA red radio signal, or what is it? Well, because it happened to be the boy at the entrance to, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to Chatham, to uh, what's the deal? To the inlet, to the inlet. You know, and, and here again, this is where, this is the third time now, Bernie, the son of the minister, thinks divine intervention has taken place. This, this red light shows up and it gets him back and moves, you know what? 
They follow it in, it's the Yinamaki to the harbor, and they get to the fish pier. And we know the rest of the story. Then they get to the fish pier, and the press is there, the, the public is there, the um, well, everything, the television, whatever was there. So it was quite a rescue. Um, Gertie was quite, uh, was a very modest guy. But it was interesting, in the book, as you read it, you get a little flavor of the guy. You know, those parents, you know, you, uh, kids sometimes disappoint us, we think, but yet they come through in the end. His father, you know, had, had a tremendous impact on him. And I think he was probably delighted when it was, when, it, when he realized all of what had happened for how his son behaved. And uh, although he stayed, in the, he stayed in the Coast Guard, now he was awarded the gold medal. He was awarded the gold medal of life-saving highest Coast Guard commendation. He wouldn't take it unless the others on the boat with him, the other three, ship, his three shipmates, received it. And, then they, and they did, in fact, receive the gold medal. And um, they were picked at random. They volunteered. And they didn't have to go. In fact, one of, the, one of the four sailors that was on the board had just stopped in the lighthouse on his way to his light ship uh, at Monomoy Point. And he, was, he didn't know anybody there. And he just thought it would be something to do. Spend some time with that. <laughs> or spend, some, spend the afternoon with these guys. And so Bernie became an overnight sensation. And the Coast Guard was treated him uh, good and bad, some liked what he did. They didn't like him shutting the radio off. But finally, the, 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 the people that were more professional understood. And they all got their gold medal in life saving. And Bernie got a award from uh, foreign, the foreign, the American Legion, not the Foreign Legion, that's maybe some other time. <laughs> the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And so he was, he was well uh, decorated for it. And uh, so that, that took care of that. Now the other ship, the, the Mercer, the cutters, they, it's also split in two. And so there were really four operations going. The bow on the Pendleton, which had the captain and the officers in it, uh, drifted away. It, it broke off, floated, floated away. And they were lost. They never found any of them, and they were just lost. The Mercer, which broke in two, had people fore and aft on them, on both sections, and the Coast Guard cutters were able to come and get them off in some risky operations. But the, the highlight of the book and the story in the movie is going to be this guy, Bernie Weber. And they're looking for somebody to play the part. So if anybody would be able to swim. <laughs> and uh, so he, he had a good career. He finished in the Coast Guard. He went to Vietnam with the Coast Guard. They sent, uh, they, they sent uh, coastal patrols to Vietnam. He trained for it, volunteered for it. It's unusual, you know, after you go through something like this and then you want more of it. And uh, so he came under fire in, in, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, came home, retired, knew there was a movie here. He says it, he's quoted in the book. He says, there's material here for a book. I want you guys to get it and get that movie made someday. I won't be around when, it's, when you do it, but there's good material for a book. He was right. It should be an interesting book, a movie. And he retired to Florida, and he's, he's since passed away. Now, they have done a couple of things for him, I think, that I'd like to share with you. They, they if I can, come on, come right up now. They, 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 here, here is, well, I hate to pass these things around because I'll lose you. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold them up. <clears throat> Here's Bernie, some pictures of Bernie. And I'll leave them here for you. You can come up and look at them later. This, this, you know, this is him. At, this is right at the time of the, of the rescue. 
Bolton mate, first class, nice looking young man, normal guy, later in life and so forth. And uh, it was called the greatest small boat rescue in Coast Guard history. Yeah, the greatest small boat rescue in Coast Guard history. Senior Chief Weber was born in Milton, son of the late Reverend Vernon Weber and Annie Weber. He's one of four sons, all served in the military. Yeah. So they named them, they built a boat and named it after them, fittingly. And I'll, I'll have to let you look at this. You'll have to look at this. It's, it's a cutter. It's right here. It's a cutter. And, uh, uh, and the um, medallion for the ship has got his name on it and the boat number, the cutter number. <coughs> And then on his, on his uh, emblem here, it says, Determination needs no interference. <laughs> you think that's right? Does that make sense? Do you like it? <laughs> I can't read it. It's, it's, and I, and I, if somebody else like to take a look at it? I, it's a little smudged. <laughs> Determination needs no interference. Well, when you look at it. So, so that was very fitting for him. Fitting, and now he has his movie. Um, the Pendleton, the, the, the uh, stern section of the Pendleton, the Akushnet, uh, backed and filled and backed and filled, maneuvered, uh, called the maneuver, the maneuvering of the century. The Mercer. The Mercer, I'm Mercer. sorry. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, they backed and filled uh, carefully, 60, 70 foot seas up and down, the, both of them going opposite directions at the same time. The captain did a great job, and uh, they were able to jump from the ship to the, to the cutter, to the fantail, the stern, of the cutter and uh, get caught by the sailors or whatever, but they rescued them. I don't want to say easy, but relatively easier than what they did on the Pendleton, getting down the, climbing down the rope ladder, 31 of them, 31 of them climbing down the Jacob's ladder, okay, hand over hand, 70 feet to the water or close to the water, letting the lifeboat come up and get underneath them and then letting go and landing on the deck of the lifeboat, hoping that sailors are going to be there to grab them and secure them and put them in, and put them in the uh, forward locker. And they did, except for Bert, except for Tiny, except for Tiny. Tiny didn't make it. And, uh, so. so that's that's about the that's about the s s total of that part of the book that will get the most has always got the most attention. Is the is is the highlight of, of the story? Uh, Thirty-two people in one rescue, and uh, um, we'll make a good. We'll make. I'm sure it's going to be the part of the movie that you're going to see the most of. So, uh, you know, I'd like to. Yeah, I have a couple of fellows here, career men, that I'd like to uh, introduce you to. One of them has served a career on, in the uh, Merchant Marine on T2 tankers. So if he'll, he'll give you a little good idea of what life was like on these things. Now, th these were called, uh, what, they had names for Kaiser, Kaiser <coughs> Coffins. Kaiser, Kaiser built them. They're, they're sort of the Kaiser Coffin. They had other names like that. So these guys, these sailors, captains and officers, they knew they were in danger. These ships were in with jumbo eyes, they had steel, there's all kinds of stories. You don't know what to believe. Cheap steel, sulfur steel, uh, soft steel. It, but it seemed that the cold water in a fully loaded ship was doomed if it was a T2 that had been jumbo eyes and welded uh, in Germany, really, but some of them, but wherever. And that's what had happened. It, those are the ships that had happened to, nine of them. Nine of them, yeah. and there was one here more recently. Uh, 
down off of Delaware, the, the uh, Marine Electric. Maybe some know it. It was a ship that carried coal to coal to Brayton Point from Virginia. And it went down, and three men, oh, we had the third mate came. I don't know if anybody was here. The third of you were here. The third mate came and talked about it. He was a survivor. There were three survivors. 52 people lost their life. Yeah. So it happens quick. They snap, they fill up with water, and they're down, they're gone. And uh, so, yeah. So, if, if I could answer a question, I'd be happy to take any. And if you don't mind if I lie, I'd be happy to take a question. But I think really what I'd like to do here is introduce these two gentlemen to you and, uh, and, let, and, and let them talk a little bit about their experiences, especially the fellow that lived on the tank, that shipped on the tank, as to how they lived their life. And the other gentleman is uh, spent time on a light ship. No who's and as. <laughs> no, I know it. That's why. I, that's why I think it's interesting. What's a light ship? What it's like on a light ship. So, anyways, this gentleman, uh, the first fellow I'll introduce you to, is a lives in town. They both live in town. Graduate of the Maritime Academy, Massachusetts Maritime Academy. Uh, spent a career at sea. Is a has achieved the license. Chief Engineer, which is the highest license that he can get, and uh, is teaching, instructing now at the Maritime Academy. Very qualified, fulfilled engineering officer. And he's right here with me, Francis Collins. Francis, it's all yours. You want your picture of your T2? Tough act to follow. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Your visual aid. Visual aid. Yeah. No, you got to check it. Hi, I'm Francis Collins, and I've lived here so far all my life, and uh, spent most of my life at sea, and um, did sail on the T2s and the T3s. This is a T2. This is a T3. Look exactly the same, and they were, except the T2s were turbo electric drive. They had a big electric motor that ran the propeller, and the uh, T3s had a reduction gear, straight, straight steam reduction gear type propulsion. Um, the ships had just anywhere between 42 and 52 men on them, a lot of people. Today the ships, uh, my last ship, I retired three years ago, and we had 18 men on the ship, much bigger than this, and that's the average size crew today is about 18 people. But when you got 52 people on a ship and you have a crisis or a catastrophe, it's pretty tough. You've got to, you've got to really muster the people, you've got to keep everybody calm, you've got to get them organized and try to get them off the ship. As Jim said, when you're out there in, in big seas like that, I don't know if you can see the, the water line on this ship loaded. You know, we'd be coming up the coast, I've come up the coast in these T3s, T2s with 50 foot seas and you're looking out a porthole and you're trying to see where the sky is looking up like this. And uh, you just go along like a duck in the water. But when you get up in the shallow water where these folks were, um, what happens is the seas come much closer together. Now out in deep water, the, the big 50 foot seas are a long way apart. But when you get in the shallow water, now they're heaping up like this. Now at some point, the ship is sitting on the top of this sea. The bow on the stern is flapping like a, like a, like a limp rag, and that's how they break. Now these ships, there were 600, 481 of these ships built. They were a T2 SEA-6. They were turbo electric ships. They had great big electric motors that drove them. They were... Uh, they were built in the Second World War between 1942 and 1945. <clears throat> the uh, welding was still, all welded ships were brand new, pretty much. We had, didn't have a whole lot of welding technology that could allow us to put these ships together correctly. We didn't have finite element analysis, computers, and all that stuff, which we have today. So a lot of the stresses were compounded in, this, in particular areas, and because of the, uh, the lower quality steel that we had in those days, that when they flexed, like a paper clip, you bend a paper clip, eventually what happens it breaks, huh? Well, that's what exactly what happened to the ships. Cold water, flexing, um, high, high sulfur steel, they didn't make it. So what they did, they took and they took a big torch and they cut a slot right down the bow of the stern, both sides. 
and they cut a big slot, bow to stern on the side, both sides. And they took riveted plates, and they riveted plates over these slots. Because a crack in steel has to have something continuous to follow and make a crack all the way through. So if you put a crack arrestor on there, the ship, the hull cracks, the crack stops right there. That saved them. So after they found out what the problem was with these ships, and as Jim said, there were several of them lost. There was one of them, the sack, the uh, Schenectady, went on sea trials in Portland, Oregon, went out and did his sea trials, came in, tied up at the dock, no wind, no sea, nothing, and all of a sudden, boom, there was this massive crack, and she broke in half sitting right at the dock. <laughs> so, didn't even get, didn't even make it first trip. But when they put the crack arresters in them, that took care of the cracking issue. When they went on to, uh, they have a very successful career. The last, the last T2s were probably out of service in the mid 70s. You know, they had a long life. They were frequently they would cut off the, the sterns of these T2s, the engine rooms, and they would stick them on a four bodies. And, and the ring electric was one. Um, there's any number of them that have been made into other type ships, and they made them. <coughs> The original ships carried about 125,000 barrels, and that's about, uh, let's see, 6 million gallons. And they carried, some of them carried many five different products, three gasolines, uh, diesel fuel, kerosene, who knows. Um, but they were very, very prolific ships. They were in use all over the world. Everybody used them. They, they were hard to beat. They were, the machinery was so reliable and dependable. <clears throat> there were two classes. The first, the original class, and then there was a bigger class called the the mission class. I don't know if any of you folks were here when they did the the, uh, uh, the Apollo moonshot. They built the tracking ships up in the floor of a shipyard. Three big white ships they did. There was the, the Apollo, the Vanguard, the Mercury. They were mission class T2 tankers. They had 10,000 horsepower. The early ones only had 6,500. But it was kind of, it was always, it was always kind of enjoyable to be on these ships because there was always a great rivalry between the engineers and the deck officers. And the deck officers lived up here in the forward house. <clears throat> the captain and the mate and, and the second and third mates and the radio officer, they lived up forward. Everybody else lived back aft. The engineers and the, and the, uh, and the, the deckhands and the, and the engine crew and the stewards about, and they all lived back aft. So on a real stormy day, there's a catwalk. You can see that. I don't know if you can see this big enough, but there's a catwalk that runs between the, the three houses so you don't walk on the deck so you get washed overboard otherwise. But on a stormy day, you see the mates coming back for lunch or for supper or what have you. And they'd be coming back down, and the wind be blowing in the seas. They're getting soaked. And we have watertight doors at the house, and they have dogs. Usually have six dogs to seal them up. So you'd see them coming, and you start pulling the dogs down. You know? And they'd be yelling and screaming. <laughs> and we wait till they get good and wet before we let them in. <laughs> but uh, you would see, I've seen on these T3s coming up the coast um, in heavy going, never three or four inch pipeline, steel pipeline on deck. So you come washing aboard and would roll that pipeline up just like fire hose. Mm -hmm. See, holy mackerel, this is, you know, this, these are all welded down, there's pipe hangers on the deck. See, he doesn't care about that. You'd see a sea come over the side of the ship between the, the midship house and the aft. Look like it's all, looks like it's all um, sp spray and spume coming at you. Boom, hit the house like that. You say, holy mackerel, where'd that come from? It didn't look like there was any solid water in the whole bunch. So it was, uh, it was quite an event working on these ships, and particularly running up and down coastwise, um, we're deep loaded. Uh, I remember one night I was on a ship on, a, on this one here. This was the Vantage Venture. This was a T3. And the captain owned a piece of it. And they had had a charter to run lube oil out to India from, for uh, mobile. And it was voyage charters. Well, the years, the, uh, the uh, the Israeli war in 1967 happened and shut down the Suez Canal. So now it's going to be too long to run the ship around the Cape of Good Hope up to India. So they had us doing coastwise work. Well, still voyage charts. So every trip you made, the faster you made it, the more money you made. So we're steaming along there one night. We're running light, unbalanced. And when you're, when you're on a ship like this back of the engine room, when you hit a big wave, the ship is just like a you know, what, what doesn't bend breaks, and the whole ship goes like this. So you're back in the engine room, and you're getting flipped off your feet practically. <laughs> so I called up to the wheelhouse. I was on, uh, I was on watch, and I said, to, I said, Kappa, you going to cut it back at all? He said, well, it seems all right up here. What do you think? 
They said, well, we're getting knocked off our feet. Well, if you think it needs to be cut back, you go ahead and cut it back. So Frank did all the drugs. He wasn't going to slow it down because it would mean he's going to be losing money. <laughs> so, but uh, there are lots of, lots of fun stories about these things. The, uh, the ventilators, most of them didn't have mechanical ventilation. They had these big cowls. And I remember uh, when my kids were little, I got off the big ships and I worked on the tugboats in Boston and we used to bring the kids in on the weekends and go on the tugboats and uh, we were docking one of these tankers one day and they said, Dad, what's that? I said, what's what? She said, those. And they went, like this. And they, <laughs> and they meant the ventilators, the ventilators on the ships. But the funny thing, well, these ships made about 14 knots. So if you're going along at 14 knots and you got a headwind, you had a pretty good draft coming down into the engine room. If you make it 14 knots and you had a 14 knot wind astern you, guess how much ventilation you got in the engine room? None. <laughs> so, and the other thing was, uh, they had a they had a big open fiddly. We call it the, the upper area of the engine room, in the top. Big open fiddly, and you have these big doors that opened up to let fresh air and stuff in. And uh, we'd be coming up in the winter time. Come out of the Gulf of Mexico and the sea temperature is 75 or so and it's temperature is probably 70, 75 degrees and you get up and as soon as you get out of the Gulf Stream, you're in 35, 40 degree water. You'd have fog up on the upper engine room and it would be raining. <laughs> so it was, uh, but they were good ships, they really were. The, the guys, the T2 guys were, uh, um, they were a breed of, of themselves. They were the spectacular electricians because the ship was all electricity. And the beauty of it was that they were all AC, all of the other, most of the ships were all DC, so it was always a pain in the neck if you wanted to play a radio on the ship or a television or something, because it was, you, didn't, you didn't have the, uh, you had to buy all kinds of converters and, and rotary generators, you'd hear these things buzzing and humming all over the ship, people trying to run their radios. But um, they also had, they had, uh, they had nine tanks, which would have been 27, but the number one tanks only was port and starboard but there was Port Stabbard the center. So there were 27 tanks on these ships, but up in the very bow, they had um, the tri-cargo holds, and they used to carry cases of oil, grease, barrels of oil, and stuff like that. So it, in one case, that was a grand, uh, that was a grand um, uh, protection for me on this, on this ship. We were going in the, uh, the Panama Canal one night, and the Gatun cut. Now the Panama Canal was the only place in the world where the captain is totally relieved of his responsibility to navigate the ship. The, the Panama Canal pilots, they take over the ship. He's just going to stand back and, and hope like hell they're going to do it right. And they generally do. But uh, for some reason, the pilot on the outbound ship, which the name of it was the Sally Mersk, I remember it clearly. It's a regular, you know, the, the Danish, the biggest steamship company in the world today, Mersk clients. But uh, they were coming out, and he was in a big hurry, and they ran right into us. When we got done, their gangway was on our foredeck. <laughs> and uh, and the uh, there was a piece of hull about about oh halfway up this wall and halfway to the windows that was set way in from the collision. But luckily, it was in the dry cargo hold. Now we had a 125,000 barrels of kerosene on the ship. Now kerosene is explosive in any concentration, from from you know 0.1 to 100 percent. So it was it's like whatever. They hit us in the right place. So. Uh, <laughs> But you know, by and large, uh, the, the ships were safely run, and they were they were they were very e efficient. You rarely ever had a, a breakdown or, 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 or a, uh, a casualty on these T-tubes. They were they were terrific ships. They were 500 and around 20 feet long. Um, they were, as some of the some of the uh, license guys said, that they just jumboized that ship. They used to say they jumboized it. They they jumboized. They put a full body on. Um, Keystone had a, a bunch of great big long ones. The, the uh, the Keystone of the Cherry Valley. Uh, the last one I sailed on was the Cherry Valley with Keystone. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you. Any questions about the life on a tanker? How long would you be out? Um, in those days, you, I would be gone probably a couple of months. I was used to do a lot of relief work. We started to have, have a family and we had children coming along, so I didn't stay off too long. But, uh, I'd be gone a couple of months at a time. But if you're on the coast, it wasn't too bad. You know, you could, you could telephone regularly. And <clears throat> yes? So is the only problem when they happen when they jumboize these teachers? No. No, pre, pre jumboize and then they're breaking up. After they jumboize, they'll break through the broke up. But, but you, you seem to uh, appreciate the design and 
Oh, it was a great design. It's just that they didn't have the they didn't have the the, the analytical techniques at their hands. At that, I mean, this was the day of slide rules and pencils and papers. You know, um, they didn't they didn't have the, the the technology that we have today where you could really go ahead. I don't know if I remember this correctly, but Kaiser was incredible in the Second World War. They were turning these things out. Was it one a day? Or something Liberty like? ships, one a day. One a day. Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah. No wonder it was so difficult to know whether or not to write. Yeah. You know, at that yeah. rate. Yeah. But they were very durable. Liberty ships. Some of them broke up as well, but they went on. If we, the last Liberty ship in Boston, I was working on the tugboats in those days, was an Argentine flagship. She took a full load of scrap from Charlestown, in Charleston, Charlestown, and she was bound for Buenos Aires, and she was part of the cargo. That was the last time they just said, no more than 30 years old, I'm not sure anymore, they're done. So that was the last of Liberty Ships. Yeah, Richard. Francis, I think the uh, History Channel, I saw the program, was very interesting on building those ships. The Kaiser was competing with other companies to see how fast they could do it, and they had it so automated, it was incredible. Well, they built them in, in East, East Portland, Maine. Sure. Uh, they, you know, they built them all over the place. They know Baltimore. There's two left of the Liberty <laughs> And they're up the T2s, there are none. They're gone, finished. Yes. Uh, Fran, if if the uh, ships were all electric, what what powered the electricity? Steam, steam turbines. Steam. steam turbines ran a big generator, a big AC generator, twenty one hundred and sixty volts, and it was uh, and they vary the frequency. To, 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 it was a, a, a synchronous motor, and that's how they got the speed on the propeller. Well, yeah. backing up a little bit, something had to generate the steam. <coughs> what, what made the steam? Oil fired boilers. Oil. They had sectional okay. boilers. Yeah. Francis, yes. in the collision in the Panama Canal that you were on, who bears the responsibility, the pilot or the captain? Pilot. The canal. Oh, the canal will find every way. A couple of years ago, we went through the canal and we had a, we have a steering light required. Panama Canal steering It's a blue light way up in the floor mist. That's no good. No good. We've got to get, okay, so we go back and we get a new light. So we put the, I go send my guys up, they mount the new light up on the floor mast and the ship. Next trip through the canal. Too bright. <laughs> <laughs> so that they, uh, we came in one time from a trip to the Far East, and we came into the canal, and we hadn't been through there in several years. And they came out, and they put me through an inspection like I have never been through by the Coast Guard. I mean, we had to, we had to do everything. Drop the anchors. We had to test the, the pull on the on the winches. We had to, I had to demonstrate how many starts, this was the motor ship, how many starts we got on the engines without the air compressors running. I mean, boy, they, if they want to make sure that there's something wrong, they can blame the ship. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, Francis, uh, with all the horrendous storms at sea and so forth, typhoons and everything else, you're all over the world, what's the most precarious uh, situation you were in in a ship? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of them. I think probably the, the most, the, potentially the most dangerous one. I was chief engineer on a little tanker running between Boston and, and Bangor, Maine, and, and the, uh, we were going up there one morning, and it was very cold, a lot of sea smoke. And the mate was, was captain that trip, and he was a very, um, very jiggy guy. He just, he was very, very nervous, you know. And, and the two old deckhands were telling him we were going up. Get head up, head up into the river, they had a Bonovsky Bay, and they said, you know, Cap, you're too far to the left, you got to get over here to the right, because they could see the tops of church spires and stuff over the top of the sea smokers when the water is very, when the air is very cold, like down around zero, four or five, ten degrees below zero, and the sea temperature may be only 30 or so, so it's like a steaming kettle, and maybe six or eight feet of this fog over the top of the water. And he, then he just kept his face in the radar and kept looking at I said, geez, Captain, you better get over. They're too far over. No. The next thing you know, bing, bang, boom, we ran right up over a boulder. We had a full load. We had 25,000 barrels of three, three products, three gasolines, and a diesel fuel on there. And it opened the bottom up all the way to just go to the engine room. And I had a big upset in the engine room. Holy miracle. So <laughs> we went up there, and he, I said, don't. Don't even think about backing. Stay here. You know, the tide was coming. It would lift us. They want to back up and, and you know, rip the more the water out. So uh, we got her off, and we made it over to the dock in Searsport, and we pumped her out. Oh, my God. It was a funny story. We were up there. We were filthy dirty trying to save this thing, you know. We had to go up to a grocery store to get something. And one of the deckhands in me, and we were covered with dirt and rust and grime. And we went into the grocery store, and the lady says, I know what you fellas been doing. You've been nice, <laughs> missing, you've been nice missing, ain't you? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we should have something like that. <laughs> so we got to run. Anyway, we got to try to get the website and see us port. And we use the, 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 uh, the, the, the Navy of the military pipeline that goes up to Bangor to the airport. And we pumped her up and we were shot two barrels. That's 84 gallons. We were shot two barrels of product. The, the ocean kept everything in, you know. But Jesus, when I, when I saw her on the dry dock, I said, holy good God, oh man. <laughs> Oh, yeah, not a good day for swimming. You know? So what happened when we pumped it out? The water came in the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we sealed it all up and we brought it. it we, we would call it bringing it home on the tank tops, but in this case, it truly was the tank tops so we brought it home. So, yes. You pumped air in, as you, as you. No, no. Just, just we just once we got it pumped out, we just sealed everything up and put some mattresses on some of the big holes. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, the T2s were—they were—they uh, were quite a piece of equipment. They really were. They were—they—they uh, uh, they were a wonderful, wonderful ship. They were always—you could always tell a T2 because it had three great big round portholes in the wheelhouse, three big portholes. And Liberty ships had the same thing, but they were the only two ships that were built like that. So, if you got any more questions, I'm glad to answer. But I think my my grandfather here, Peter Wood, is going to tell you about the light ship, and that's interesting. <laughs> Okay, Francis, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Is that good or what? Yeah. Going to the sea. Right, Francis? Yep. The next guest is another local young man. Went to high school here. Was in the Coast Guard. Was in the Army. Went back to the Coast Guard. <clears throat> And back to the army. <laughs> but boy, it gets better. Retired from the army as a sergeant major. Those that know, an E9. Mm. And congratulations to Peter Wood. Come on up, Peter. <laughs> His time on the Boston Lightship when it was there. We all remember the Boston Lightship. Good evening, folks. Hi. I, uh, with my, my grandson over here, uh, <laughs> actually, Finn and I moved into Coasa about the same time, 1947. Yeah. Uh, so we've known each other quite a while, but as Jim said, I spent some time in the Coast Guard, but I can remember as a kid going out and seeing this thing called the Boston Lightship and not thinking too much about it because it was about maybe five miles out and about I think around eight miles out of Boston Harbor and uh, <coughs> then I joined the Coast Guard in 1959 January uh, and I it was a 13 week boot camp and you put down a list of where you wanted to go <coughs> you used to call it a dream list and it was because I didn't want to come back here and I didn't even give a thought about the light shift but there was an icebreaker here called the East Wind, and she was going off for a trip. And if they went down to Antarctica, it was a good trip. If it went north of Argentina, it was a bad trip. It was absolutely nothing to do. And the Coast Guard, in their infinite wisdom, there were 10 of us that came back to Boston. And the East Wind needed nine people on the boat, on the ship. And they did it all alphabetically. And I, my last name was Wood, so I, I was number 10, and I ended up in the Boston Light Ship. And it was actually, it was pretty good duty in some ways, but I mean, I knew nothing about a light ship. Absolutely nothing. They'd never been on this one, had seen it. Um, it, it, was fairly, it was good duty in the sense that we go out there for four weeks, uh, and then we come ashore for two weeks. And when you're home on, when you're on the two week leave, you don't have to go anywhere. It's just plain, flat, two weeks, you're home. Longest time I spent out there at one time, and it was all weather related. Uh, it was about six weeks, and it gets very small after that period of time. There was a crew, on average, about 18, but half of that crew were ashore every two weeks. So, I mean, you had, you had the same people for two weeks, and then another two would, would come in. But, and I was on her for about, let's say, about 18 months. I went on her in April of 59, and I got off in November of, uh, November of 60. Excuse me. Um, there was service out of Point Allen, uh, and the whole idea of a light ship 
and they went up down the east coast, down the, uh, uh, the Gulf, and up to the west coast as well. They were basically a floating lighthouse. And ships coming in and out of Boston would use us like a, a, as a lighthouse. And the only, we had, there were two masts that were open. This is a picture of it. And in between these two masts, there was a radio direction finder that would emit a signal out. And that's what these ships coming in or going out would hone in on. Uh, and then we had the infamous foghorn. Before I go to that, it, we had a, a captain was off, as a chief warrant officer. We had a, a chief, uh, chief boatswain mate uh, as the exact a chief engineer. Uh, obviously, was the engineer. We had at any one time either maybe if, if we were lucky, we had three seamen, of which I was one, uh, and we always had a full complement of the engineers. Uh, and it there was always half of that crew ashore. Uh, so it, it was interesting in, in some ways, um, boring in some ways, exciting in some ways. Um, four weeks doesn't sound like a long period of time, except it is when you're sitting there and you can't move because they're anchored. Uh, and the, you've got 135 feet to go around. Now, imagine, I'd rather be on that than on minus light. Or Braves light, or any lighthouse for that matter, rather than Boston light. But it, um, I want to talk about the fog one a little bit. Uh, there were two distinct blasts. I'm trying to remember, I was trying to think of it today. I think it was like every minute and a half. And I could hear it here in Cohasset. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what it's like on a light ship, any light ship. Uh, and the ship would, the ship would set to vibrate a little bit. We slept a little bit. This is the fog one right here. We slept up in here, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the noise. Fran and I were talking this morning. He, he can he can do a very good imitation of what the horn was like. You <laughs> <laughs> hear that for about three days, four days, twenty four seven. Except loud. Pardon me. Except loud. Yeah. <laughs> you really do. In, a, in some ways, you get used to it. Uh, but you, you, you train yourself, you just automatically stop talking because you knew the blast was coming. And then the other thing I can remember, when I'm coming home, I get in my car to drive home, and for about the first two or three days, the car was doing this. Because that's, that's what the light ship did. You know, so again, think of that, you know, if you're in this bad, you know, it, it, uh, it's interesting that way, but that foghorn, um, I heard one about 10 years ago on a light ship that had been restored, and boy, did it bring back memories. I mean, that is one loud sound, and you, you get used to it, but you don't get used to it. You know? And I, if I remember correctly now, if, if the visibility got below a mile, then the horn went on. Uh, and it just, uh, that's the one thing I remember most about that, is that far horn. Just didn't miss it a bit. I was asked a couple days ago what, what a, a day in the life of somebody in the light ship. And your standing watch is a 24 7 watch stander. Um, so your watches are either four on, eight off, or six on, and six off. There's really not a whole heck of a lot to do. Uh, the seamen would, uh, it would just do deck maintenance. Uh, the engineers, they kept the engines running. I have absolutely no, I think I went down in the engine room probably twice. We're sure. But they worked hard. We did. <laughs> I, mean, you, you, I mean, think about it. You can only paint. You got 135 feet of ship. How many times can you paint it? <laughs> but they did have, I, I can remember, they, uh, they had all linoleum decks on it. So every single time, you take a can of kerosene, steel wool, take all the wax off it, Rewax it. I mean, th th this is really exciting stuff. <laughs> they had, you know, you have to have something to keep you busy. Yeah, back in those days, um, there was a television. I mean, your entertainment up there was television. We had a, a very, very, very small library on it, uh, or cards, or reading. I mean, that's in the winter time. I mean, what can you do out there? Uh, it. Um, 
We were blessed with the, the cook that was on the, the ship that I was on, kind of like the, uh, this tiny in the, uh, uh, on the other ship. We used to call him Baby Huey. He was a huge person, but he was one great cook. I have a picture in, in a scrapbook of this Huey standing on the deck, and he's got three people on his shoulders, <laughs> working his way up. And he was like, just, I mean, he never go on the service today. I mean, they just, he was just way too big. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The way the ship was laid out, the crew was here, there was a small little recreation deck here, the mess deck was here, and the aft end of the ship here was all the water. This building here was the, uh, this cabin here was, was the ship's office, and there was a chain locker up here. They had two huge mushroom anchors. One directly on the bow, and one coming off, coming off the side. Uh, there's a little story about the fog on I have to think about the brick. I found about this one. I was on a watch one night, and couldn't see a thing. I mean, there was the, the fog was that thick. And our radar was out, which was usually what was happening. Uh, and I heard a ship's horn, and I couldn't find it. And in a heavy fog like that, the sound moves around. You can't really pinpoint where the sound is. And we had, there were two people on watch, it was myself up on the bridge and an engineer down below. Uh, and all of a sudden, off the stern, I saw the set of lights go by me. Now, they're supposed to say at least a mile off of us. But they, you could, all you could hear was the, the, the stump pumping of the screw and the, the exhaust and all that coming out of the stack. And it was the chief, it was the uh, chief petty officer, who, the chief boatswain mate, who was uh, the acting CO at the time. And he was sleeping aft. And he made a beeline for the bridge when he heard it. Uh, and that little uh, mistake on my part, for, by not waking him up, there was absolutely nothing we could do. I mean, if the thing hit us, it hit us. Uh, but forward in the chain locker, it cost me 20 hours of extra duty because I didn't wake him up. <laughs> and I had to go into the chain locker with a, a scraper and scrape a chain locker. You know, uh, so I, get, I became more vigilant if I was standing on <laughs> <laughs> you know, it. it, it um, We'd have, every so often we'd have to get a new seaman on board, and we had a little nasty indoctrination for the new people, and everyone on the light ship had to go through it, myself included. <laughs> and it was really up to, the indoctrination was how, you know, how crazy we wanted to be. Now mind you, we're all 18, 19, 20 years old at the time. We had one night, we had a, a, a brand new seaman on watch, uh, and we snuck up on the flying bridge, and at night, when there's absolutely zero visibility, you hear the fog on, obviously, and we've got the, the, the bright, uh, the beacon light up the top of the mast. And it's, it's, it's an odd feeling when you're out there because it just, it's a totally different feeling than if it's a beautiful day and the sun's out and all of that. But we snuck up on the flying bridge and sat up just bang the port a little bit like this. And of course, he had absolutely no idea what was going on. Then we go to one of the other portholes and do it. <laughs> and a short while later, we peeked, poked our, 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 you know, our head over. The, we, the poor kid was back, backed up into a corner <laughs> with his hand on, on a knife. He had absolutely no idea what it was that we were doing. It was, it was, he didn't think it was very funny at all. <laughs> and they had another little trick we used to do when some new, new one came on board. We'd tie him up to a chair, hang him over the side, up to his waist in water. And as the ship was going up and down, I mean, you know, you've got to think things to do. The old shipping well, go back to the colonial times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we didn't kill all of them. Did they do that to you, Peter? Pardon me? Did they do that to you when you first came on the ship? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Not, not, the, not the chair part of it, but oh, yeah. I, one night, I thought they did this to me. Everyone that was new on it. Um, Fred was talking about the storms, and Jim was. Uh, I uh, rode Hurricane Dawn, which is back in 1960 on that ship. They had um, they sent us ashore. Not ashore. They sent us to go back in a port because it was a nasty storm. Uh, we couldn't get in. I mean, this thing only would do eight knots wide open. <laughs> so we got outside of President Rhodes, and we couldn't make any further headway. So they sent us a back out. We dropped an anchor. Uh, they sent one of their cutters out there to stand by us all night. 
which would have been absolutely useless because if the ship went down, it was going to go straight down. We were going to go with it. Uh, there was one watertight door on the ship, and it went into the engine room. Every other door was a regular door, not dogs. We had dogs on the bridge in the ship's office, but that was it. Um, Can I hit that bridge? Oh, sure. The, um, I remember one point, Rich asked a question about you know, what was the, the one or the, the thing you remember the most or the most dangerous thing you did, Don. During that hurricane, I was up on the bridge and we had a first class boss in the mate there. And I was doing something, not looking up the port, and I heard he called to me, hang on. And I looked up and the ship was going up. And I have never seen a wave so big in my life. It came in off the quarter. We went over uh, and just sat there and it shuddered for a short while. And I'm assuming, I'm not an engineer, but I'm assuming it's deciding which way it's going to go. <laughs> so fortunately, it came back up again. But my sister-in-law, about 20 years ago, gave me two letters that I hadn't seen since I wrote <coughs> to my parents, uh, one after this hurricane and one after one of the many uh, northeast storms I, went, I, I was on out there. And I read that thing for the first time. I don't remember writing it, obviously. Uh, but it's amazing what an 18, 19 year old kid will write to his parents. <laughs> uh, and I still have them. It's, it's kind of neat to have. There was an uh, interesting thing here in Cohasset. Uh, back sometime, I think in the 30s, there was a gentleman who used to bring newspapers out to the light ship. Uh, and then I think his name was Davis. But he put $10,000 into a trust. Uh, and there used to be a gentleman here in town by the name of Pat Reed. And every Sunday, weather permitting, Pat would come out from Cohasset uh, and bring the newspapers. My parents would throw together some stuff. And other people, you know, they could get down to Point Allen or Cohasset. Uh, and I don't know how long they did that. Pat passed away. I don't know if anyone took it over. Uh, but uh, it was, and it gave you a little bit of, you know, feeling of home. I mean, something, you could read the newspaper, you get fresh brownies, <laughs> things like that. Um, the Cohasset Yard Club used to use the light ship when they had the 210 races as one of the turning points. And they come, I don't know if, how many of you folks know of sailboat racing, but they come, they want to cut every mark as close as they can. And it was always interesting to watch all these 210 converging on the light ship. <laughs> and then, I mean, they would really cut it close. Um, Ken Jason, who used to live here in town, one time he bought his um, niece and some of his niece's friends. And I don't even remember why they were allowed on the light ship, but I can remember they were allowed on the light ship. And we really didn't want them to leave. <laughs> but they left. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> well, I do remember one thing. Uh, um, back in those days, almost everyone smoked, myself included. Uh, and we ran out of cigarettes. And we take, I mean, you're going around looking at ashtrays. Is that absolutely what's left? Trying to smoke it. Somebody got the bright idea there's emergency rations in a life raft. We didn't have a lifeboat on the ship, we had a life raft. Well, mysteriously, that life raft happened to come loose and inflated. <laughs> and in that was, there were Paul Mall cigarettes that had been packaged during the Second World War, all wrapped in paraffin. Now, I haven't smoked now in 40 some odd years, but I can tell you, I can remember that, taking that first hit on that cigarette. You talk about dry and harsh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a cigarette. That's all we cared about. I can remember we used, we used to watch American Bandstand. It would come on at 4 o'clock every afternoon. Uh, and faithfully would go on. There was a small television, obviously not color or anything. Uh, it, it was hard sometimes to fill up a day because, as I say, a television, reading. Summertime, we could go fishing. We swam off the light ship. Uh, we'd have to drop a ladder over and climb back up again. I never told Fran this, but this is how you know, nuts you get sometimes out there. We had a whale that came by. One of the engineers thought, we ought to go whaling. <laughs> 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 True story. He went down to the end 
bedroom, made a harpoon. <laughs> we, we, and we were we were all set to go whaling. And then somebody, and I, I, I'd like to think it was me, but it wasn't, said, you know, we might get in trouble on this. If we if we harpoon this thing, what do we do with it? <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was, I look back on it, it was interesting. I mean, I'd have rather gone on one of the different ships. If the East one was going south, I'd have give, cut my eye teeth to take that trip. Uh, one of my closest friends on the light ship got transferred off, did go to the East Wind, and he made two great trips down to Antarctica. And I have to say, I was a little bit jealous when he did it because I couldn't get on it. But it, all in all, it was a good. Um, it was a good 18 months. I mean, if you balance everything out. Uh, the funny thing is now, I mean, I, I sail by it, and like all of us, you know, I have a, I get a pretty good size ego, and it really bothers me to realize that I've been replaced by a buoy. Big old one on buoy with a beacon. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions or anything like that, I, 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 like Fran, I'm really glad to answer it. <laughs> no, we did not have a fire in the engine room. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, how long has it been since? There hasn't been a light ship, um, and where did they go? I assume there was more than one light ship. In, in I believe they, the last one came off station about eighty-five, and, and, and it was where, one of the, it was one of the Nantuckets. And where where is it gone? There must have been other light ships too. Where most of them, <coughs> most of them are all trash. Some, right. believe it or not, some have gone to other countries. There's one, one in East Boston. Pardon me. There's one in East Boston. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, Oh, yeah, that one in East Boston. I've actually been on that and gone on the way on it. That was that was built, I believe, in 1935. It's a devil boat to, to a, a ship to steer because it's all it's all steam driven on, a, on the wheel. So you turn the wheel and you have to wait. There's a delay. Uh, the other one, uh, one of the last Nantuckets, was there used to be two Nantucket lights. With it. <coughs> the one I was on. But once a year, we'd go into Boston and little, um, do some, some work on it. The Nantucket, said, well, Nantucket light ship is about 26 miles off of Nantucket. Wow. So they had two light ships, and they relieved each other. Uh, but the last, one of the last Nantuckets uh, went on eBay, oh, maybe five years ago now. It was owned by the NBC, and a fellow bought it for $125,000 off of eBay. Converted it. You, it's, I mean, literally a yacht. I mean, I don't know why anyone would want it, uh, but it is a yacht. It's unbelievable down below, uh, and it can be bought now, I believe, for five million dollars. Wow. <laughs> yes, sir. Were you ever concerned that you're going to be run down by a ship that was homing in on you? Oh yeah, that's what cost me twenty hours in the chain line. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's. I mean, obviously not during the day or anything like that, but right. at night in the fog, because it's, it's really heavy fog. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's, it's a weird feeling at night. I mean, I know Fran's seen it, I know Jim's seen it, but it, it's strange because it, it's like, it just envelops you. Well, uh, it has happened. It has happened. In the early days yeah. of, of radio wireless, of their radio direction finders, the ships would home right in on that, on that DF. Yeah, the and, would, and they, they, yeah. the Nantucket light ship was run down by a steamer and sunk yeah. back in the, in the, in the teens. Matter of fact, the one that's in East Boston, I believe, was paid for by uh, the English government because it was an English liner that ran down. The Titanic sister ship, actually, the Olympic. Yeah, the Olympic, yeah. <laughs> but the rest of them, they're, they're, the one that I was on, for instance, last I knew, was somewhere in Chicago. Uh, but most of them, they're really not, they're not really good for anything. Museums? Yes. Why wouldn't the foghorn prevent other ships from ramming into the Light ship. I mean, is that what the fog point is for? Oh yeah, well, I, I don't mean it's quite the way it's not. You'd have to ask to get you know, ship driver on the ship that hit us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're there, we're stationary. And you're, you know, you're we've got the horn going, we've got the beacon going. <coughs> and that's, I mean, that's that's how we could do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we couldn't move, we couldn't get the anchor up fast enough to move. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, the whole thing, because they're, they're, they're honing right in on us. Rich. Uh, a few years back, Marshall and I were uh, down in Maryland and uh, near Chesapeake Bay, and we saw it. we were a little bit away from the, the ocean, but we saw this ship that turned out to be a light ship, and it was on land, and it had been 
mourned, not mourned, but uh, put up there permanently. There's no water right there. There was next to it. That's how they got it there. And it was beautiful, and it was restored beautifully, two masks and so forth. I think it had a name on it, some of the Bells or Falls, something. Oh, yeah, so it's Falls, it's out of Delaware. Yeah. There's one in Delaware, there's one out in the West Coast, there's one up in Michigan. But this one, that we, the one that we were at, that we were looking at, it, it was beautiful. We had pictures, a lot of pictures of it in it and so forth. Oh, yeah. And I was talking to the fellow who was in charge of it about the Boston Lightship. He said, this is the Boston Lightship. He said, if you look at the side of the hull, it's all painted beautifully, but they painted over the Boston letters, and you can still see them if you look carefully. I thought it was an Antarctic. No? no. We, saw, we saw what he was talking about. I thought it was an Antarctic. Well, they had, yeah, they had the relief, too. I mean, so they moved it all over the place. Oh, yeah, because the Boston... Well, I'll, I'll get you some pictures of it. Anyway. Yeah, the, the, the last I knew, it was up in the Great Lakes someplace. Oh. And somebody, somebody bought it and was running some kind of cargo on it. I mean, I don't know how they could do it. I mean, I know the configuration of that ship, and it's, I mean, it's 135 feet. You can't put too much on it. Well, well, the guy wanted one day, Cape Islands from. Did he really? Yeah. Well, you, you know, the, the one thing about getting run down that we have to think about is now that we don't have light ships anymore. It's not obviously it isn't an issue. <laughs> but in the days we're talking about with these Pendleton and the Fort Mercer when they went down, <coughs> these ships had one radar on them that sometimes worked. They had a gyro compass. <laughs> Um, and other than that, it was all uh, uh, dead, dead reckoning navigation. And they may, they, they might not have had a site for a couple of days with a stormy weather they had a good status site. So they weren't awfully sure exactly where they were, and particularly ships coming in from offshore, they're, they're looking at the, if, if their IDF works, radio direction finder, they're all going now too, but if their direction finder's working, they're gonna head right for that ship. And, Peter says that the guy that's up there steering isn't paying attention, he can run right through that damn place. Sure. And that's what happened <coughs> often now and again. Today we've got GPS, we've got, you know, skillion different ways of determining where we are right now, you know, in the world. Because in those days it was all, it was the skill of the, of the navigators to figure out where they were. And yeah, one thing I'll say about the hurricane also, and it's another thing I haven't forgotten, during the we, and you can see the storm, we knew the storm was coming up. And it hit us, and then the eye comes in. And it's an incredible thing when the eye hits, everything stops. I mean, the sky is absolutely clear blue, and then the back end of the hurricane comes up, which was even worse. And this it occurred all during the day and that night. The next morning, you would have not known anything happened. It was flat, calm, beautiful sky, and I'm thinking to myself, 12 hours ago. <laughs> yes, Ralph. The Nantucket was actually bought and used as a museum ship for a long period of time. And it, it made several cruises, including to the uh, Statue of Liberty celebration in New York, and it was sort of on the anchor ship right off, right opposite the Statue of Liberty. Um, but generally, it was used for taking people out on, on little excursions, and principally for kids, but it was a museum ship for a long period of time. Well, your father, had, your father yeah. was involved in that. He bought it. Yeah. You know, yeah, I remember that long time. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think there's that. I, I know there's none running. No, it's not running. You know, you know, up here, other than the one over in East Boston and the, the Nantucket that's now a yacht. You know, so did you ask? Did, did you have a question? Or did I answer it already? Yeah. Um, you oh, okay. Any other questions? Thank well, you very, very much. Good. Thank you, Peter. Is that picture of the uh, light ship making its way around? Mm -hmm. it's, it's out there. Can we get it in here so the others can see it? The light ship? Come on. Oh, here it is. Come on. Oh, oh, right down. Right down. Yeah, oh, I get 27 more copies. <laughs> Do you? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know if that. I think everyone has. Yeah, yeah, stop yeah. inside yeah. of the light boat. Sorry. Yeah, right. I think you can. Stop inside of the light boat. Oh, okay. Well, <coughs> there we are. Did you have any questions on the finest hours? Anyone? I nothing about the book. Yeah, I had one question. If I can answer it, really seriously, yeah. Do you remember when this hull was on the uh, Coast Guard boat? Yes, Bernie Weber. And then there was a, a, another craft further out, which was obviously heck of a lot bigger than that. But he was told to come out to meet that boat. Yeah. And he put the thing in his pocket. 
the phone and yeah. did his own thing. Did anything come of that? They wanted to court martial him for that. The commander wanted to court martial him for that. From one end of the spectrum to the other, huh? From being a gold medal winner, he's a hero, national hero, to be going on the break. They squashed that. They just, yeah. yeah. Everybody remembers that. There were three light bulbs that went out. That's what I thought you were going to say. There were two of them, said two of them back. They couldn't make it. That too is a big part of it. Uh, the heroism of uh, Bernie Weber's life, what they went out and two others couldn't do it. Jim, I think that boat is still down there and is a, is a... Good question, a, Peter. A, uh, Francis, really. Yeah. We were talking yeah. about it earlier. This gentleman knows all about it. It's down in Rock Harbor, in yeah. Orleans. Yeah. 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 The, the, uh, the, the fully operational. It does go out on public relations missions. National Wildlife Service took it over <coughs> and they retired it as they had another develop another model and, and they didn't know what to do with it they moved around here there and everywhere it ended up on the back of a warehouse or something a fellow named quinn who was a photographer was going through stuff down there looking to take photographs and he saw it he, he recognized it. he saw the number on it <coughs> excuse me he said that's the boat that saved all those people and so they brought it out and they offered it to the town of uh, chatham <coughs> with maybe it should have went to the historical Society, Kathy, said, said no. <laughs> shame. Yeah, shame. And the Orleans Historical Department Association took it over, got the money, raised it, all volunteers, seven hour, seven days a week until it was done, restored it. And this, gentleman can, this gentleman here can see it recently, he'll tell you what it looks like. Oh, it is like. beautiful. It's in, it's in pristine condition. So it's worth going down there if you're ever down in that area in Chatham. Would you tell us exactly where it is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in Rock Harbor. If you go down the Mid Cape Highway to the Rotary in Orleans, go three quarters of the way around it and get off. You go about 100 yards and you come to a T. If you turn left, just follow that road all the way to the end, you'll be at the entrance to the pier, um, at the far end of which is where the boat is tied up. And you can go on the boat, so and you can get a ride on the boat. <laughs> Yeah. Now you know the rest of the story. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've, we've had the Orleans uh, twice at the Antique and Classic Boat Festival in Salem, and both times she's come up under her own field. Oh, yeah, the great. that's great. I, I guess it goes up and down the coast. It would be great to get it to go. I asked her, good for you. We had it twice. Yeah. That's good. Well, there you go. So you know that if you can take that home with you, if you want to from the association to get it to come by. You can go up and go on it, and uh, it was the interesting one. Okay, so uh, we all see sick yet? No? <laughs> in the newspaper, I thought it said they were oil tankers, and they, so did any oil get spilled into them? It, when the 1952 Oh, that, yeah, sure. You mean the, these ships here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, oil, oil spills are, you know, let Francis maybe address it. Oil spills are interesting, especially kerosene <coughs> and lighter oils like that. They evaporate. They don't, they don't give them a lot of, they used to, they don't give them much regard. Heavy oils come ashore and you know, all over the rocks and you see all that. But the lighter oils, they, and especially in a storm like that with the seas, it just breaks it all up. And, and yes, even with the heavy oil now, when the, back in the, how old is he? 38 years ago, when the, uh, uh, what's the name of the ship? Come? <laughs> the Argo Merchant, when she went up on the Antarctic shore. Good. 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 Let me give you your license. Yeah. <laughs> the Argo Merchant went up on the Antarctic shore. I was chief on a big sea going salvage stuff. And we would just spread so from New York to stand by and see if we could get work this this uh, big tanker off the off the bit off the uh the bar there, you yeah. know, up there and that was not one of the coast guards finest hours so that's another story but uh, <laughs> uh, when we got there she was intact and everybody was on it and when we left just the point of the bar was sticking up above the yeah. above the ocean yeah. but she was full of black oil basically uh, yeah basically six oil she was bound for salem in the power station so it was heavy black thick Oil. Some of these ships and it disappeared. There was none yeah. came ashore. It just the whole oh, right. it disappeared. We didn't have any on our, on our I got a couple of spots here. There was a company in Houston that made a dispersant. You could spread it over oil, and it would break it down so that you couldn't see. It was a 
oil dispersers. This was just normal natural. It was not yeah, I understand that. But this was this was <coughs> they were selling it, and they made them stop it. We were astounded. The, huh? We yeah. were astounded. The, 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 the hull of the Pendleton. Where is it? Where's the hull of the Pendleton? Sticking up. I want it. Oh, it's still there. Right oh yeah, right here. Oh, no, that stayed there 26 years. A lot of you know that, but that was there for 26 years. And probably leaking a little oil, leaking, you know, they're full of oils and she was heavy, heavy like that. Yes. When they ran over the Nantucket, when the Olympics came, yeah, yeah. Do you know what happened to the people, the 18 people on it? The people on the flight yeah. ship? Yeah. I don't honestly know. There was a loss of life. I don't know how many. Does anybody know what happened with that? I think, I don't know how many. I know that one of the flight ships have a more years. The hurricane. No, the ship that was run down by the Yeah. Uh, I know there was some. Four, four that survived, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, speak up. I think there was four that survived or something. Four that survived. Four There's only four on it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Only no, no, four? No, no, no. no. You'd have about probably eight, nine. Okay. Seven, eight, nine. Half of them? Half yeah, survived. Yeah. 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 Life at sea. Life at sea. Hurricane, uh, I think it was 1935. The Montevideo lightship, what happened, she, it yanked a chain right out of the bottle, but then it sunk. Yeah. So I, what they did on those ships afterwards, they'd take the last length and tie it. You know, so if, if, you know, if that wouldn't happen again, but it took the whole bow off and the whole crew had to drown. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Things happen fast in the sea. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Any, no, no questions. Well, I hope you all get to see the movie. It's two years away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.